The book on the concept of irony is actually Kierkegaard's master's thesis. Kierkegaard divides his thesis into two parts. The first part examines the concept of irony. It examines irony as a concept. In part two, Kierkegaard is concerned with irony as a phenomenon. And the reason for this structure is that without the concept, we cannot understand the phenomenon. So what is irony? Before we go on, I need to explain what irony is. The simplest form of irony that we are familiar with is when what we say contradicts what we think. So for instance, if I hate sunny weather and I see that it is sunny today, I might say, what a great weather. But in such a case, we immediately understand that I mean the opposite of what I'm saying. Kierkegaard explains this in a more philosophical way. He says, irony happens when the essence contradicts the phenomenon. Why is Kierkegaard interested in the concept of irony or in the phenomenon of irony? Because for Kierkegaard, subjectivity starts with irony. Irony is the first step that a person takes towards subjectivity. For his understanding of irony, Kierkegaard relies on Hegel's understanding of irony. According to Hegel, it was not always the case that people were subjective in society. It was not always the case that people had their own opinions in ethical matters or in any matter. One's family, one's tradition, one's religion, these were what people referred to when they wanted to do ethical reasoning. According to Hegel, the first person who actually put his own subjectivity above tradition was Socrates. And for that reason, Kierkegaard is interested in Socrates. After all, Kierkegaard is a philosopher of subjectivity and individualism. Philosophy begins with doubt. We know this. Ever since Descartes, we know that we should doubt in order to be philosophers. For Kierkegaard, there is something much more important, namely life itself. So, in order to live as a single individual, life must begin with irony, because irony is the first step towards subjectivity. As Kierkegaard puts it, a life that may be called human begins with irony. Kierkegaard's concern in the first part of the thesis is finding the real historical Socrates. Socrates himself never wrote anything, so he never passed down anything to us. What we know of him is the result of the writings of Plato, Xenophon, and Aristophanes. Kierkegaard examines the writings of these authors to find out who the real Socrates was. These accounts differ from one another, so only one of them should be the right one. In the interest of time, we will just say that Kierkegaard believes Plato's account of Socrates is the right one, so he disregards the accounts of Xenophon and Aristophanes. Here, I don't want to spend any time explaining why Kierkegaard disregards these two other accounts. We have more important things to talk about. But to satisfy your curiosity, for instance, he disregards Xenophon's account simply because there is not a trace of irony in Xenophon's Socrates. Now, the Socratic method is rooted in irony. So if Xenophon's account of Socrates lacks this aspect, we should disregard it. So what is this Socratic method? In the interest of time, I will explain it very briefly. When Socrates engages in a conversation with someone, he wants to show that the person doesn't really know what he is talking about. So for instance, Someone might claim that he knows what beauty is, or he might know what piety is, or he might know what it means to be good. 
In such a situation, Socrates would go on and question this person. The basic structure of the argument is as follows. If what you are saying is true, it should result in A, and through contradictions, he shows that A cannot be the case. This causes the person to revise his idea, and then he might come up with B. Socrates does the same with B, and so on and so forth. Thus, he refutes every revision of the original idea. At the end, Socrates will not tell us what, for instance, beauty is. The only thing that we will be left with is knowing that we do not know what beauty is. At best, we know what beauty is not, because Socrates showed us some examples that did not explain what beauty is. So you can question people in two different ways. The first way is the normal way. You ask a question and you seek an answer. In this case, when you question, you want to be fulfilled. You want to be satisfied. You want some answers. There is another way that you could ask questions. You want to question in order to undermine your opponent. You are not interested in finding any answers. What's important for you is showing that your opponent does not understand what he is talking about. Kierkegaard calls the first method speculative and he calls the second method ironic. Of course, the method Socrates uses is the ironic method. When he asks questions, he does not wish to leave something positive behind. He does not want to leave an answer behind. Rather, he wants to leave an emptiness behind. By the way, remember that the great wisdom of Socrates was that he knew nothing. So, the philosophy of Socrates began with the presupposition that he knew nothing. And it wanted to end that philosophy with the presupposition that human beings know nothing at all. What Socrates did was huge. He wanted to show that the authorities, or anyone for that matter, did not really understand what they were talking about. Throughout his life, Socrates saw that students gathered around their master as he talked about philosophical concepts. But in his heart, Socrates knew that these masters never understood what they were saying. These teachers knew nothing. So what he did was that he went around society and he undermined these teachers and he made them look ridiculous in front of their students. This caused much upheaval in his society. People who held high positions were concerned about this because what Socrates was doing in essence was undermining tradition. He was encouraging the students to think for themselves. Sometimes it comes as a shock to people when they hear that Socrates was executed. They ask, what was all the fuss about? Why did they execute a 70-year-old man? What harm could such an old man possibly have done to his society? What Socrates did was huge. He introduced a new ethics. He showed that people can think for themselves without relying on tradition. And with this simple act, he gave birth to Western civilization as we know it. To be more precise, he gave birth to Western ethics. Based on this perspective, what he did radically upset the balance of his society. What he did was perceived as threatening. So based on the ethics that existed when he was alive, he was a very dangerous man. But of course, their story did not come to an end when they executed Socrates. As Kierkegaard tells us, once having made its appearance in the world, subjectivity did not vanish again without a trace. So subjectivity and irony persisted.
When Kierkegaard was writing his thesis, he also saw that his contemporaries also used irony, but not in the way that was constructive. Many centuries had passed and people had become immune to the attacks of irony, you could say. So he says that our age demands more. Our age demands, if not lofty pathos, then at least loud pathos. If not speculation, then at least conclusions. If not truth, then at least persuasion. If not integrity, then at least protestations of integrity. If not feeling, then at least verbosity about feelings. This means that if somebody today wants to use irony, he cannot do it in the way that Socrates did, because we have become used to that. We need a more radical form of irony, and that's exactly what the Romantics did. But Kierkegaard took issue with what the Romantics were doing. At least when Socrates used irony, unintentionally he gave birth to subjectivity. But the Romantics wanted to destroy tradition without constructing anything in place of it. Now we come to the second part of the thesis. As we said earlier, irony happens when the phenomenon is not the essence but the opposite of the essence. Kierkegaard explains, when I am speaking, the thought, the meaning, is the essence and the word is the phenomenon. So if these two do not match, then you have irony. Why would anyone use irony in this way? Because it gives the ironist a certain superiority. And this superiority comes from not wanting to be understood immediately. Kierkegaard gives us an example. In order to distinguish themselves, kings and princes of that era spoke French. By the same analogy, the higher circles, you can say the nobilities, the intellectuals, or the educated people, speak ironically so that lay people will not be able to understand what they say. So in a way, irony is the process of isolating itself. It does not wish to be generally understood. But of course, people being people, they rarely can be ironic in this sense because people have a vanity that makes them want to be understood. They always leave a trace behind that what they are saying is actually ironic. But for Kierkegaard, the highest form of irony takes place when the person remains ironic to the bitter end. That's exactly what happens with Socrates. Kierkegaard says that even his execution was not tragic, it was ironic. This might sound a bit bizarre, but Kierkegaard explains what he means. He says, the tragic hero has an understanding of death, and although he is not afraid of death, but he still knows it as something painful. He knows that it is the end, and that's why he embraces it tragically. Both the tragic hero and Socrates had this in common that they do not fear death. But Socrates believed that there was a life beyond death, a better life for a philosopher to be more precise. So Socrates does not see death as a punishment and thus it is an irony over the state that it condemns him to death and believes that it has inflicted punishment upon him. Kierkegaard talks about a very rare form of irony. In this form, the ironist does whatever he can to fake his position and not to be understood. This gives him a joy in private, and the source of his joy is that no one realizes his deception. Remember that Socrates always claimed that he did not know anything. But such an ironist might claim that he knows something when he doesn't, and he might claim he doesn't know anything when he actually does. So basically he is not afraid to be depicted as someone stupid. So the more his stupidity appears to be, the greater will be his joy. As Kierkegaard puts it, 
It can be just as ironic to pretend to know when one knows that one does not know as to pretend not to know when one knows that one knows. We have seen that the ironist is free from the shackles of tradition. He is free and above it. But this comes at a price. Actuality loses its validity for the ironist. Everything becomes just an aesthetic possibility. Because if we see tradition as something completely arbitrary, then we can replace it with absolutely anything that we want. And then we can replace that thing with something else. Although there is a positive type of irony that leads to subjectivity, there is another type of irony against which Kierkegaard warns us. He calls this type of irony, irony in the eminent sense. Irony in the eminent sense is directed not against this or that particular existing entity, but against the entire given actuality at a certain time and under certain conditions. So when someone uses irony in this way, and when he wants to destroy a particular thing, he destroys that particular thing by destroying the whole system. This is the dark side of irony, because the totality of existence gets contemplated under the aspect of irony. In the spirit of Hegel, Kierkegaard also refers to this type of irony as the infinite absolute negativity. It is negativity because it only negates. It is infinite because it does not negate this or that phenomenon in particular. And it is absolute because that by virtue of which it negates is a higher something that still is not. Kierkegaard goes on to distinguish between irony and other phenomena. He tells us that irony is not dissimulation, because dissimulation focuses on the objective aspect of an act, namely the discrepancy between essence and phenomenon. But as we showed earlier, there is a subjective side to irony, and this subjective aspect is the pleasure that the subject gets from freeing himself by means of irony. Also, this simulation has a purpose, but irony has no purpose. The purpose is nothing other than the irony itself. Further, Kierkegaard distinguishes between irony and hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is only one-sided. The hypocrite always tries to seem good even though he is evil. But irony is something far more radical. The subject may pretend to be evil, although he is good. We should not forget that Kierkegaard was a religious thinker, so his interest in the phenomenon of irony could be traced back to his religious beliefs. There is a peculiar intersection where Christianity meets irony. Remember the phrase from the Bible, vanity of vanity, all is vanity? Well, the ironist believes the same thing. Both the ironist and the Christian have this assumption, but they come to a different conclusion. For the Christian, all is vanity, but this is only insofar as through this negation all disturbing factors are set aside so the Christian can focus on God. For a true Christian, God is an absolute reality against whom everything becomes a vanity. This is not the case for the ironist. The ironist wants to show that all is vanity so he could become free. The more vain everything becomes, all the lighter, emptier, and volatilized the subject becomes. Therefore, the ironist wants to make everything as vain as possible. But in doing so, the whole of existence becomes alien to him, and the ironic subject in turn becomes alien to existence. This is achieved by transforming actuality into something unactual. But as we said, irony itself is not a bad thing necessarily. Kierkegaard believes that, world historically, we always need ironists, because without an ironist, there cannot be any progress. Remember Socrates, 
Without him, we would not have any subjectivity, any freedom. The freedom that we are enjoying in the West today is because of Socrates, because he was sacrificed. By the way, Kierkegaard saw himself as this kind of a sacrifice. Throughout his life, he lived like an ironist. He wanted to be the Socrates of Denmark. Progress demands irony, because thanks to irony, we can show that what we accept as tradition may have some problematic aspects. By means of irony, we can open the way for other possibilities. So in this sense, the ironist is like a prophet. What does a prophet do? He shows that there can be another future. But where they differ is that the prophet has a vision, whereas the ironist does not. So the ironist points to a future, but he does not know what this future is. And although he has no idea what this future is, he sacrifices himself for this future. The ironist is a sacrifice that the world process demands, not as if the ironist always needed in the strictest sense to fall as a sacrifice, but his fervor in the service of world spirit consumes him. So the ironist is sacrificed and he opens the way for the infinity of possibilities. Like everything else, this comes with a caveat. Kierkegaard warned against the way the Romantics used irony. He referred to the Romantic way of using irony as living poetically. Of course, living poetically does not mean writing poems all day long. It means living your life as if it were a work of art. If you are living your life poetically, you see your life, for instance, as a novel, a novel in which you are the protagonist, and you go on to romanticize and aestheticize everything around you. This is, of course, very dangerous, because a romantic will deny that there is any actuality. He imagines that he can invent a new reality for himself. We normally believe that the events that happened in our past are objective. Nobody can deny them. But the romantic denies the existence of such objective events. He reinvents his past. For the romantic, anything that happens before is not binding. So everything established in the given actuality has nothing but poetic validity for the ironist. After all, he is living poetically. For him, life is a drama and what absorbs him is the ingenious complication of this drama. He himself is a spectator even when he himself is the one acting. So when something happens in real life that doesn't seem poetic enough to the romantic, the romantic will reinvent this event to fit into a bigger narrative, into a more aesthetic narrative. Therefore, for instance, if the romantic repents, he does not repent ethically. He repents only if he sees that it is poetically appropriate to repent. Furthermore, the life of the romantic becomes nothing but moods. Of course, every living human being has moods, but in a healthy person, the mood is just an intensification of the life that ordinarily stirs and moves within a person. But for the ironist, the most contrasting moods succeed one another. As Kierkegaard puts it, at times he is a god, at times a grain of sand. But throughout all his moods, all these fluctuations, one thing is permanent, and it is his sense of boredom. Boredom is the only mood that will persist. The ironist would do anything not to get bored. Instead of what the Romantics do, Kierkegaard proposes what he calls controlled irony. Because as we said, we need irony in order to become a single individual. We all know about the importance of doubt in science and scholarship. What doubt is to science, irony is to personal life. Just as scientists maintain that there is no true science without doubt, so it may be maintained with the same right that no genuinely human life is possible without irony.